Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my talk on machine learning and uh, code review. So, uh, my name is Philippe. Uh, before starting on the subject, who am I? I'm a security researcher for GoSecure. It's a security company uh, based in Montreal. Recently, a merge acquisition, when I call uh, GoSecure Counterattack. Uh, what do I do for the research team? I'm mainly focusing on uh, finding new vulnerability class, developing tool. Uh, some tools are open source, so uh, because I like, uh, I'm a, I used to be a developer and I really like AppSec, I've started to develop a static analysis tool that I'm gonna present also in this talk. So one of them is uh, Find Security Bugs. It's an extension for spot bugs, and it's focused, it's adding a lot of rule for security uh, to this uh, project that is called Spot Bugs. Uh, so this will cover any project that is Java related, Kotlin, Groovy, Scala. Uh, there's another project that I've started. It's called uh, Security Code Scan. Uh, this won't be the, uh, mentioned in the talk, but it's covering uh, mostly VB.NET and C Sharp. And because I've done a pen test in the past, I've come to develop uh, multiple burp extensions. So maybe you have used uh, one that I've developed. I'm not an expert in machine learning, but in the past year, I've started using it for a project. So uh, that's what I'm going to present uh, today. So in the first section, I'm going to go through uh, some basic uh, statistical analysis concept. This is going to be uh, mostly theory. I managed to slide in a demo in this part, but this is because I really need to uh, introduce some concept that will be uh, used when I'm going to present the model I'm using for machine learning uh, for this project. I'm going to have a demonstration of uh, the, the final tool which is still experimental, but I have a demo of this tool. And I'm going to conclude with a lesson learned from uh, my first experience of building a real project with uh, machine learning. So maybe if you're starting your own project or you have some ID, uh, this is something, two things that you could consider. So first, this is going to be uh, slightly heavy, so it's going to be a, a bit of theory. But I have just a few concepts to introduce uh, to you to make sure we're all uh, on the same line. So the first element uh, for statistical analysis that most uh, semi-advanced uh, statistical analysis tool will do is symbolic execution. Is contrary to dynamic tool, we don't have access to uh, runtime data when we analyze code. We're purely looking at, uh, at code. So statically, here I have a pseudocode on the right and the ID uh, with symbolic execution is we're going to either try to resolve condition or try to evaluate a state of variable at a specific moment. So, uh, for example, in this pseudocode, we might want to uh, test how can we reach the uh, condition where it's true. So, then we transform the condition into an equation and try to solve it. So, that's one use case. Uh, not all condition will resolve into an equation but can be possible. So then I have a quick example to show you how it works. So really simple example. So I have first a variable that is initialized called A, then a second variable that is initialized named B. And now we have a small operation, multiplication between two variable. Now C, instead of having the actual data at runtime, it's gonna contain input two multiplied by two. So we keep only the symbolic form of it. Now in symbolic execution, every time we're gonna hit a branch, so a condition, we're gonna try to evaluate uh, the different states. So we're gonna copy each state. So first we're gonna do the path where the condition is true. So we have this state until we reach the end of the method, for example. And now we have the state at the end of the method of each variable. Because there was another path, if the condition was false, where A was added 44, now we have another state that could have been reached. So this is the theory behind a symbolic execution uh, with a quick example. Uh, symbolic execution is uh, interesting if you want to test how can we reach specific paths? So, for example, if you're testing C++ code, a lot of the bug rely on can we reach this state with this bound plus one or whatever. 
Uh, one other thing that uh, that will uh, affect any language is we're trying to look at the state of variable. So more than just their, their value, we're going to look for is it safe or unsafe, or taint or untainted. So here I have two code examples. So the two things we're going to track with taint analysis is the sources. So are they safe source or, uh, or tainted if they come from user input? But also, we're going to track uh, their transformation. So as we do the, the, exec, the symbolic execution, we're going to, the, the state might change because uh, there might be a validation uh, uh, with a whitelist. There might be a validation with regex. There might be some encoding with some function uh, appropriate for the context. And we're going to do some validation when we reach some sen sensible API that does maybe uh, SQL queries, uh, uh, receive as input a template, that sort, sort of API, and we're going to check the state of the, the sensible parameter. So, so the left uh, pseudocode, because it's a config, you can assume that uh, it's not something that is going to be controllable uh, from the user uh, perspective, so from an external attacker, for example. While an HTTP parameter uh, likely to be manipulable by a, a remote user. So, like the symbolic execution, I have a quick step-by-step uh, -step, uh, example of how data analysis work. So, it's going to be similar to the previous code we saw. So, first, there's a variable that is initialized with user ID equal. So, this is a static string. Uh, in uh, find security bugs, this is going to have the state constant, so consider it to be safe. Then we have a second variable that is initialized that's going to be tainted because it's a known API and get parameter. We know it it's, uh, can be user input. Now we have concatenation. So we have a constant and a taint variable that are combined. This will result into a taint uh, values, meaning that once we reach uh, this apply filter that I think was either a Scala or a Groovy uh, API, basically apply a filter in SQL. Now we can check the, the state of the variable C at this moment and confirm that it's tainted, so we should report uh, this bug as a potential vulnerabilities. Already uh, a demonstration. So. Quick question. Uh, any people in the audience have already used uh, find security bugs? Yeah, I'm going to zoom in the code. Uh, so, uh, anybody by raise of hand have used uh, find security bugs? Okay, one person. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea why I decided to uh, ex extend a spot bug, which was called a find bugs uh, two years ago, is uh, spot bugs already has integration into IDE. So, by developing rules uh, with this API, then I could, could develop my tent analysis and it would uh, integrate with uh, NetBeans, Eclipse, IntelliJ, but also SonarCube and other uh, platforms. So the idea is that a developer would have his project with code. Here I'm using an old WebGoat version. And all it has to do is, now I'm going to zoom, I have the plugin uh, for find bugs, and I can analyze all the project file this way. I'm going to do it slightly quickly. I'm going to sc scan a specific file just to give you an example. So I'm just triggering an analysis for this specific file. Won't take long. So Okay, so we can see we have three uh, warning here. Uh, there were multiple uh, call to execute query, but only three that resolve into uh, a warning. So for each warning, if we click on it, we'll see that in this integration of uh, spot bugs, we'll get a few property, including uh, the category of the bugs, and we'll also get uh, a small description brief description of the risk, 
what not to do, what you should do. So a good indicator on what the, the solution would be to resolve these vulnerabilities. Now, what's interesting is that in this code, I hope I'm moving not too fast, not all execute query call were flagged as potential vulnerability. And that's important because you don't want to flag every call because uh, the security uh, analyst will just do some triage and at some point will get uh, some fatigue and will miss some actual vulnerability. So those that we can confirm as safe for sure, we should try to eliminate them. This way, it's less work for the developer or security analyst. So here, uh, the reason it didn't tr trigger a uh, vulnerability is like I described before, this is uh, using a string builder and all the value uh, combined into the string builder are constant value. So they are safe because we know where they are coming from. In this case, there's no reason to, to, um, to flag this. So even if there's some branch, we can identify that at any point in this method, uh, at the, the string builder will use safe source. The second example, uh, if you look quickly, you might say it's uh, vulnerable, but here there's a small transformation uh, because it's an int. Uh, there's no injection point that will be useful for an attacker. It will only be able to specify a number, so you won't be able to uh, do a union or any malicious injection with that. So here the, the code example are pretty straightforward, but uh, it's doing complete uh, symbolic execution on all the methods, so even if you have assignment, it will track down the variable uh, along the way. Here we have another uh, cases that is supported, is here uh, we're having an input that will eventually reach the, um, the SQL queries, but here we have a transformation. Uh, it's not good code, I was just trying to give example along SQL uh, uh, injection example. Uh, obviously, you should prefer um, prepare statement over manual encoding, but here we're using uh, SAPI that will encode the parameter specifically for SQL. So what uh, find -sweet bug will do in this case, it won't mark it as safe, but it will add a tag that it's safe specifically for SQL. This means you cannot use an encoder, uh, a SQL encoder, for example, to mitigate against XSS or vice versa. So those are all three cases that are uh, managed. But there are other cases, just one quickly, that won't be uh, uh, mitigate. Here we have uh, Web Session, which is a custom class from uh, WebGoat. It's uh, calling get username and the return value is used in the query. Because find speed bugs doesn't know about this API, it doesn't know for sure if it's a safe value and it, if it can be trusted. So for this reason, uh, we're going to raise an error. So this was to give you a quick overview about the tool I'm talking uh, since the beginning, so you have a better idea. Uh, and also, how data analysis work and what type of uh, cases we try to eliminate. There are still many obstacles. Uh, right now, uh, Find Security Bugs does data analysis uh, at method level, so it won't look uh, by default at uh, method calling other methods, so we won't backtrack uh, to, for variable tracking across multiple methods. And uh, there are many reasons why we cannot, uh, why uh, uh, backtracking uh, against multiple methods will miss a few things. Uh, first, the, one of the obstacles to static code analysis is reflection. With frameworks, there's a ton of uh, value that will be uh, pre-filled automatically, either method call or field, uh, just by design of the framework. So those are harder to, to, uh, to see from a statistical analysis perspective because the call is not in the code, it's indirectly. At runtime, the method will be defined. Uh, so dependency injection, really similar. So the idea is you have, you're going to have multiple services in your web application and every of your services will expose an interface instead of the class directly. So anything related to inheritance, it's more level of indirection. Uh, second order of an opti, this will imply uh, 
a database or a data storage. So think, for example, if you're having an e-commerce website, when you click the Submit Order button, at this moment, not everything will be done. So it would most, like, most likely be pushed to a queue. Then there will be some payment verification. Then some other services will do payment processing. Then, then maybe uh, the stock will be uh, verified, etc. So not everything is done in line. Because the data is stored, so in, uh, for example, in the database, and then read after, it's harder for the tool to know if a uh, value read from database is actually user input. So. And the last two are more related to design. So these are not bad practices, but these are uh, effects that um, will have an effect on a statistical analysis. So encapsulation, anytime you wrap some API, because they are commonly used in your uh, web application, the static uh, analysis tool will have our time and find what is actually being used uh, just by because you're wrapping uh, the API. And anytime you have custom framework, so for the example of WebGoat, where they wrap all the HTTP part in web session uh, classes, utility class, for the static analysis tool, it's all mystery what those API are actually doing. So, But this doesn't mean that these are bad practices. These are actually good practices for other things than security. So I'm not saying don't use framework or uh, don't use dependency injection. But uh, there's two main challenges that result into uh, trying machine learning. Uh, I would say the two main were, uh, I know they might uh, don't seem to have a link, but in the end, both will uh, uh, motivate the machine learning part that I'm going to talk about. So because we're not doing um, uh, interprocedural data flow, so interprocedural is just a term to say we're doing data flow across multiple methods. So uh, this, in general, explore the, the graph and the, the call to check. This has many, uh, this has some caveat, but some interesting advantage. So one thing I've I always had in mind is I don't want to eliminate um, every NLP because I'm seeing one path and one case, there's a safe source, because I'm not 100% sure that I have all the code. Often, you're analyzing just a small component, so you don't know the big picture. Sometimes, you'll miss how the framework works. So if there's some dependency injection that you don't see or some reflection that you don't see, you might not see all the paths. So it's really hard to rely on, the, on this to remove uh, cases. But it would be interesting that if we can find a path where it's exploitable, like we can see that a tainted source can reach a valid sync, then would be interesting to put it in priority to the developer to say, this case, we're pretty sure uh, you should fix it because we have one case where it's exploitable. So we're not necessarily eliminating false positive. That's why I didn't put the, the effort into it in the early years of uh, fine security bugs. Uh, also, proprietary uh, framework and utility, it's an interesting problem because we cannot uh, predict how a company will name their internal classes. But at the same time, if we record enough metadata, uh, not necessarily on the cloud or whatever, but if we record them, uh, we could see potentially patterns. If uh, a specific source is reaching an API and it's always marked as false positive, maybe this API is something safe, uh, maybe a configuration class or something local. So that's the idea. So the perspective I'm trying to do uh, with machine learning is trying more to prioritize rather than eliminate cases because insecurity compared to maybe other field that would use static analysis, insecurity, one or two vulnerability might be critical and make a big difference. So we don't want to miss any. Uh, so the prioritization will help on the efficiency without uh, eliminating and hiding as potential vulnerability. So that's the, the mindset I had when I started the project. So why machine learning? Uh, I had always th those two uh, ideas in mind, trying to do prioritization. And then I listened to a few uh, machine learning talks, and I really saw it seems to, to connect with uh, my needs. So 
the general definition of machine learning is we're going to use that uh, technique to, uh, based on the data, produce algorithm. So without explicitly program if else condition with specific value, those algorithms would evolve depending on the data we're inputting to the uh, machine learning algorithm. So that's interesting because I can be really creative at extracting data that might describe the, the API and the property uh, framework, but it won't be 100% re reliable. But because machine learning is flexible and can adapt to the data we're giving as input, this could work. So there are two main class of uh, machine learning. There are supervised and unsupervised. Supervised uh, rely on human classification. So you need to have a portion of your data set that was previously classified by a human. Unsupervised, it's actually a different objective. We're more trying to uh, cluster data together. So um, we don't need a human that will classify a specific entry. Instead, it will try to group them. For example, uh, doing image recognition to uh, find similar images. So we're not trying to I find specific things in the, in the picture, but we're trying to find similar one. Uh, I put an arrow because uh, obviously my use case is supervised uh, classification because I want to classify a few bugs and get the resulting, the, the remaining bugs prioritized and evolve over time. So we can do a supervised classification if we need to target specific classes. So in the case of uh, my project, it, is it a false positive or an actual vulnerability? There's also another class that I won't touch here. It's a supervision, supervised regression. And this is if we want to calculate um, a continuous value. So estimate processing, process of housing, for example, time of recovery of an incident, anything that has not a fixed number of classes. So. When I say machine learning is producing algorithm, uh, there are multiple types of uh, algorithm that can produce. Uh, knife base, a series of conditions, so decision tree. I have an example, uh, won't be too small to, to read, but basically uh, when we're gonna have new data that is unclassified, we'll start from the top of the tree and based on each condition, we'll go left or right and at the end, we'll get our value for the prediction. So that's the type of algorithm it's producing. A neural network is another one. And the idea is that those algorithms are not explicitly programmed. So it will all be based on the data, the, the training set that we're going to give to those algorithms. Um, before starting to use machine learning, uh, the first part that you should do is just visualize your data because sometimes you might not need uh, machine learning or you might not need something that advanced. Um, so when I um, load, this is a Juliet test suit. So, suit. so these are test cases, uh, vulnerability, but that are made on purpose. It's produced by the NIST. So there are about uh, 30,000 vulnerability uh, that are generated by spot bugs. And those are all the reported vulnerabilities those on the left are actual vulnerabilities. Those on the left, uh, right, are all false positive. So just by looking at the, the simple graph, we can see that for some vulnerabilities, there are actually no false positive. So we're when we're going to try to enrich our model and add attributes, we should not fo focus on those because those, at the moment, for, for, uh, for the specific test suit, there are no false positives. So and one other thing uh, I realize is that most of the uh, vulnerabilities that add false positive in this test suit were uh, injection related. So think of API like SQL injection, XPAT, uh, stuff like that. So the, the value you'll get out of machine learning will be as good as the attribute that you give as input. So garbage in, garbage out. If you just give primitive data that even a human with infinite time wouldn't be able to uh, correlate in anything, it won't work. So what I thought about is we're going to look for an attribute that code reviewer actually look 
in the code when they uh, do the triage themselves. So if we had a SQL query, what would be the first thing that uh, a developer or a security analyst do is it'll search for any data flow reaching this point and look back, are there any variables that are tainted from this path? But, uh, so in an ID, it would look like this. So the ID will generate all the path to the specific variable until it reach here, uh, we can see that account number is the dynamic value. And then from this, uh, it could be a method call or a parameter, whatever. Then the developer would take a decision based on this, what, what he's seeing, what's the context. So the developer will be able to uh, describe what's the business behind this uh, specific API. But uh, here we're going to be able maybe to record the API, for example. So. I won't go through all the, the attributes that we have added to the model, but I'll go to the main one. So the first thing we, we have uh, added to the, the model is we're going to record for every bug the source. Uh, so if a value is returned and add to a query or part of the sensible parameter, we're going to record the exact signature. So for example, the idea is that we have something like a property encoder that encodes specifically HTML. If there's some pattern where it's commonly used and it end up, end up being marked as false positive, then uh, the machine learning hopefully will uh, be able to detect it. Uh, if we have, again, encapsulation on a known API that we won't see, uh, configuration, so anything that will be safe. And the sync will be the API that is triggering the vulnerability, so either SQL, here, path traversal. Another element is we're going to start to do uh, interprocedural uh, taint analysis, but uh, we're kind of limited. We need to uh, fit those values into either a binary uh, value or a finite number of values. So uh, if we have multiple source, we cannot have infinite column uh, in our model. So, uh, the, the way we implement it first, in the first iteration, is we're going to first have the state does one source is safe, does one so source is tainted, and if one source is unknown, unknown being any unknown API. Uh, yeah, oops. There are some property related to localization, so the module name in which the code is located. Uh, same thing for file name. So if some component is more critical, there might be more risk uh, in those components. That was the ID. Uh, in practice, those didn't work really well. So uh, in order to do those uh, kind of complex query uh, to obtain, does it have at least one thin source, one safe source, uh, we need to model a, a graph that will cover the complete application. So here in, in this uh, short uh, code sample, we're uh, having a method load user that will call the API create query. So this is uh, SQL query. And just for uh, the sample call, we'll have three nodes. So uh, we don't want to model modelize all the interaction, all the assignment inside the method, because this is static. This won't change. But the, the relation between method will be uh, more volatile. So the idea is we'll track uh, the, the relation between input and output only, but internal state of method won't be uh, put into detail into the graph. So the first node we're creating is the uh, node 1, which will be the parameter input, and will be linked with the parameter of index 0 of create query. So even though there's still concatenation, it, it might have some uh, intermediary uh, state, we're only going to track the output, which is the method call that is sensible, and uh, it link with where it came from. So it could be uh, if we would have a method that return a value or a parameter here in this case. We also need to create another node that will uh, cover the specific API that was available. So this is needed uh, to cover, uh, to be able to later search on our graph model. So I'm uh, just going to name drop. I, I was using uh, Neo4j for this project. 
So we're going to have node for every uh, state. And with this graph, we're going to be able to search for a uh, specific uh, place for each variety to map to the, the specific variable state. So we're not seeing the complete uh, query here, but it was searching for any um, value that was added to the add header uh, API. So, but I, I have a full query next. So with the graph database, you can interact with different API. One of the more standard API is a uh, cipher. So uh, it's kind of interesting at uh, the syntax. The first segment, you write it like if it would be ASCII art. So your different node, you're describing them with arrows. And each variable, you can add some filter, uh, like specific uh, matching uh, name stuff. So basically, we're looking for um, this node will be uh, the element uh, uh, calling the, the vulnerable sync. So to make sure we're not calling, uh, for example, exec query everywhere it's being called in the application, but this specific occurrence related to the bugs we're looking for. And uh, we're going up to eight in depth. So this is reasonably uh, far. Uh, we're going to match for specific sync and source. So this way, uh, uh, yeah. And the, the source is uh, for this one to make sure we're, we're looking at the right call. Already the demo. So. So, um, one thing I always try to do when I develop tool is look for existing tool. And instead of developing my own UI for uh, classification, I'm uh, reusing Sonar Cube, which is a tool that uh, basically allows you to uh, classify bugs. So, you can review all the re reported uh, issues from uh, find security bugs in this UI. And then I can have a state. I can put it as false positive or confirm if it's an actual vulnerability. So what I've previously done is I've scanned uh, WebGoat, uh, all the lessons, so all the exercise. There were about 50 uh, potential vulnerability. I classify 40 something, just uh, enough, but I'm, I'm still having some vulnerability that are unclassified. So, uh, at the moment, we have a command line interface, but the, the more stable API is the one uh, using Maven. So this is the WebGoat uh, project. The first uh, step I'm going to do, I'm going to zoom in a moment. The first one, uh, step is generating the, the data. So when you're going to uh, interact with different tools, often it's going to be either CSV or uh, CSV++. Usually, a uh, different tool will have a different format, but the CSV will have also metadata describing the different attribute, but it will be mostly CSV format. And in this case, so I would just double check. Everything is ready. OK. So on the right, I don't need to zoom, the, this will be the generated file uh, on the, for the different steps. So. so the first part, I don't need necessarily to look uh, specifically on the left, but we're going to aggregate first the result from uh, the different report from spot bugs. There's close to 20 uh, submodules. Uh, we're also going to aggregate to each of those uh, bugs uh, the different property that I was talking about, like uh, taint related stuff, taint safe or unknown state related to the graph. So these were generated for every bugs. We also add the different API for sync, source, etc., cetera, and, uh, and other metadata. Uh, from Sonar, I'm also poking the, the state for uh, every vulnerability uh, that was classified or not. So we'll have three uh, data sets. So the result is the including everything. Label one are those that I have 
uh, confirm or mark as false positive. So this will be our training set. The unlabeled one is those that I have not classified yet. So uh, there's only two commands left. There's the train command. Oops. So this command will generate a model. So this model can be reused. And uh, basically, the idea is this will be a naive base uh, algorithm that is used. So once you input into the model a uh, new value, it will classify and tell you a result. Is it a potential vulnerability or is it a false positive? So this is just an intermediary state. Here we have the model that is, that is generate. And finally, what we want to see, uh, we're going to try to predict uh, for the remaining vulnerability uh, some result. So just make sure it works. OK. OK. I'm going to show you a specific example. So previously, I showed you uh, that some cases were already eliminated by uh, the basic fine security bugs due to uh, local data analysis. We still had three cases that were uh, marked as potential vulnerabilities. So, so uh, when I classified the, the potential SQL injection, every time I was seeing session get username, I marked it uh, as a false positive because I assume that um, this uh, a variable would have been validated before, and it was not uh, a user input directly. While, for example, get raw parameter, this is reading directly from uh, HTTP parameter. So every time I was seeing this that led to uh, a SQL query, I would mark this as confirmed. So hopefully, uh, the result of our prediction would put this one higher on the list. And there's another one, which is uh, again, those codes are dummy code, so uh, this sample uh, six method is never called. So it has an unknown variable, and uh, yeah, so we don't know where it's coming from. So might be user input, but we don't know uh, for sure. So hopefully, this one will also be higher than this one that repeatedly we have put as false positive, at least uh, two or three times. So it's not a big data set, so the, the accuracy won't be uh, that high for other bugs. But hopefully for this one, because I know on purpose that uh, in other cases, uh, I've put oops, username as false positive. I'm going to search specifically for those three cases. So the, um, the prediction, it's pretty primitive, the, the UI. It's, it's going to include the metadata plus link to different resources. So if you want to look at the description of the bug, it's going to link you to, to the description on the Find Security Bug website. So you get similar, something similar to the, the IDE. But really, if you need to uh, validate the code, you would need to do it into the, in, a, in an IDE. Or a Sonar Cube, for example. So here, it's going to open, and we get to the bug. Uh, one thing I need to Precise. So here, the probability is the probability of being a good, so being a false positive. I didn't do the, this interface, so uh, at first I was confused, and I, I was wondering why it didn't work. So uh, those two are less likely uh, to be uh, vulnerable than this one, with at 88% is likely to be a false positive. So, and if we open it, uh, this one is the one where it's using uh, get username. So this source, because we know that in other uh, instances of SQL injection, uh, this API was used as source, then it, it's less likely than the other to, to result into an actual vulnerability. So the expected use cases or the method to use would be you sort the bugs into the probability. And the lowest percentage would be those that are the more likely to be uh, actual vulnerability and until the, the, the end. 
So if you would have more uh, bugs, then you can just review 10 or 20, and then redo the step I did uh, to retrain and predict again. So maybe there would be some change uh, if, for example, you hit few type of vulnerability that are often false positive, then maybe that retraining, the order will be better. So that's the general demo. Um, back to the slide. So I'll go quickly to, to the result. Uh, this graph I realized that with the color, it won't be really clear, but um, anyway, so initially, this was uh, the Juliet uh, test suite. So all the reported uh, vulnerability were expected to be bad because they were reported. But everything on the right is false positive. Now, after the classification uh, with those attributes that I mentioned, all the dots that you see that are not matching those. So the color doesn't match with the previous graphic. That's the thing. So every uh, blue dot that you see on the uh, left, right part are going to be false positive and every red dot on the left will be a false positive that are not actually bad but should have been placed on the other side. So, so we can see that on large scale it, it worked pretty well. The thing with uh, reality, so Juliet is vulnerability with, uh, that are kind of fake because they are semi-generated and it's a large data set that includes a lot of positive, but almost as much uh, actual vulnerabilities. Um, this is the result we, we got with uh, with Spring Framework, and it's a completely different data set in in, in terms of uh, the number of uh, actual vulnerabilities. So, it might be encouraging to see uh, up to 95% accuracy, but this is something to be aware, especially if you're buying tools that give you stats about oh our machine learning is working so well. Uh, the accuracy is based on true positive plus true negative on all other cases. So if I look at the confusion matrix here, uh, I classified about uh, just over 600 uh, bugs, but only 28 of those were actual vulnerabilities. That means a lot of, of those were false positive. And there's a small percentage that I didn't review. There were maybe a 700 at all. So the accuracy is only based on those that were correctly classified, but the thing is there are so uh, little uh, actual vulnerability that the percentage climb really high. So there's two things that we can uh, answer to this. So first we could take the approach, okay, because in this case uh, we have so many, uh, actually zero um, false negative, uh, or yeah, false negative, that means that we could, uh, for example, in a CI alert developer directly because we're so sure that uh, the, the bugs that are going to be uh, classified uh, higher than 50% are uh, actual vulnerability, then maybe we could alert them directly to the developer because developers don't have uh, infinite time to pass for security, so every time you, they need to spend time on security, it needs to be uh, uh, well worked. Uh, another thing is we can lower the threshold, for example, uh, by default, uh, algorithms are using 50% because they try just to have the, the maximum accuracy, but if we're able to tolerate some uh, false negative, um, actually, no, these uh, 22 are the false negative, here we add zero false positive. But anyway, so for some uh, vulnerability type, it worked well, like there were four excesses, and it was always finding those. And the thing is, there were different vulnerability classes for almost all of them, so uh, maybe it didn't help. Uh, we're still uh, using a tool to, to find bugs just to feed our model, because that's the main thing we're missing. Um, we're, we're not having large vulnerability that are actual vulnerability. It's easy with Juliet to have 30,000 vulnerability, but these are not real world vulnerability, so we're uh, con uh, continuing to uh, find some vulnerabilities. So uh, just, b just before the summer, uh, we reported a few uh, vulnerabilities uh, in spring that were done during our triage. And uh, recently, we have started to uh, do more proprietary uh, library. And 
this seems to be uh, uh, cases where we're finding uh, much more uh, availability compared to open source library. Uh, so uh, we're going to release an article uh, and uh, may maybe next month related to uh, the different RC that we have found. So these are not all availability. I'm excluding all the medium one and the less interesting one. So lesson learned. If you, you would have to uh, start a machine learning project, uh, what I would like to tell you is first focus more on the model than the algorithm. So it's easy to just take the data that you have that is probably poor and try to different article to gain 1% or 2% better. But the, uh, if you have a quality attribute, this is going to do the difference. Uh, always inspect your data set. It, it, it's easy to uh, generate dynamically some value and you realize that after the time uh, value is missing or it's not ex uh, as expected. Uh, one thing that, that my colleague has observed is that some machine learning, if you don't specify a value, like it's null, like it doesn't apply, uh, because some algorithms don't support empty values, they'll simply uh, skip the, the data. So this is pretty bad and it will, won't trigger any warning. So try to place a, a dummy value to say doesn't apply any or whatever. This way you're sure that uh, it won't eliminate uh, your data. Basic stuff, uh, don't mix training set and, and test set. And these are, uh, do I have still a few minutes? Okay, perfect, so uh, I'll finish the slide. Uh, the training set needs to be close to the test set. So one of the main problems we add, if, if we review a few uh, different libraries, often the API used in those libraries won't match uh, others. So it's really hard. Uh, we were trying to add more attributes that are more, more generic, but it's really hard to have a significant one. So uh, that's one of the reasons I've started to uh, pull 120 uh, Spring libraries and focus on those because my expectation was that at least uh, some component will uh, reuse some, some of the same code. And at the moment, aggregating a uh, data set doesn't work uh, as well as expected. So at the moment, the demo I've done, it's experimental. The, the code is out. It's on GitHub. Uh, the, the graph part is was released end of last year. But it's still experimental. I wouldn't use it in production because you can have some good results some week. And the next week, you do some classification, and it's not working as expected. So uh, the good news is I'm using it uh, in a different way than I expected. So just by uh, scanning massively a uh, code, I'm, I'm seeing uh, from a statistical uh, perspective. So when I analyze, for example, a decision tree that are generated in machine learning, I'm seeing, for example, bug type that have very high false positive that I didn't expect. So we're going to try to produce some profile that eliminate those so that people that don't have just a short amount of time to do scanning can use those profile to eliminate some noise. Also, we're seeing some source that uh, are maybe uh, actually an uh, encoding method that we should add in the configuration of fine security bugs. So uh, if uh, it's always uh, a false positive when this method is used and it's a public API, why not add it to the fine security bugs as an encoder if it applies? Uh, also, sometimes things that always trigger a false positive, like uh, I have one case in mind that we're going to uh, remove from uh, fine security bugs. Uh, there was a XSS vector in a send error in G2E that was, there was an XSS that applied, but only on vulnerable version of Tomcat. So it made sense four years ago when we had the rule to detect potential XSS. But now if you didn't update uh, Tomcat at this point, you have bigger problem. So, so, uh, I'm, I'm done with the, my presentation on, on the project, but tomorrow, if you want to have hands-on experience on machine learning, this is going to be an uh, intro level. So if you have no prior knowledge of uh, machine learning, uh, I'm going to use Orange as a tool for the, the exercise. So Orange, the interesting part is there's a library part, but there's also a GUI part. So we're going to do no programming. So only um, inserting in the canvas a widget connecting them we're going to be able to uh, train some algorithm, get some visualization, 
So if you want some hands-on hands -on experience to have uh, an ID, uh, we're going to use two data sets, the uh, Titanic data set, which is a classic uh, one used in machine learning. And uh, the final exercise is uh, with data that I've produced in my project to give you more uh, security perspective. So that's tomorrow. If you're uh, interested in machine learning and maybe try to experiment for project at work or personal. And I'm done. So if you have any question, come inside.